with last week, and so I'm going to squeak a little bit up here, um, but uh, that's okay. And uh, I want to ask you, open your Bibles with me to Philippians. As you're opening your Bibles, uh, I just want to thank you for the invitation to come back. Pastor, where you at, Pastor? I know he's here someplace. I saw him just a minute ago. He's upstairs. Okay. And uh, But just uh, thank you all. It's good to see so many old faces, and there are lots of new faces. And uh, that is a testimony to what's going on here in Bronson. And so that is uh, so exciting. And for some reason, I'm getting feedback. You want me to test it? Test, test, test. I'm gone now. Test, test, test. Test. Can you all hear me? Okay, we're good right there. I don't know what you did, but... Perfect, right there, all right? And, uh, but it is good to be back. I've got a lot of stories to tell and uh, of some of your upstanding citizens that uh, were here when I was here. And, uh, and so, but I'm going to share those later. And when I say later, you come ask me and I will tell you anything you want to know about any of them. And uh, I know that many of them are scared to death I came back. No, I'm just teasing. It was a wonderful ministry here. We were here for 10 years, and uh, God called us out and uh, moved us on, and uh, we saw God really just move in a miraculous and mighty way, and it's so good to see that, because that's the most critical thing. You know, folks, uh, you and I will pass this life, and we have a call, we have a purpose for that, but uh, it is important for each of us to realize that we are to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, because it is Christ that makes the difference. You know, one of the things that uh, after 45 years in ministry, one of the things that I've learned is that uh, life is precious and, uh, and it's special. And I don't think there's any greater time that you recognize how special life is than when a brand new baby is born. There's something neat about that. I mean, just uh, the sweetness of that child. Of course, you know, I, when, when we were having, or my wife was having the babies, uh, when we, back then, they had just started letting the husbands go in with their wives to, to see the birth. I wish they hadn't done that. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, they had just opened that door, and, and of course, my wife says, do you want to be in there with me? And, you know, that is not a question that you say, no, honey, not really. I think I need to wait out. And you just say, yes, ma'am, I do. I want to be in there. And, and uh and I, I'll never forget, I mean, uh, the, the, the miracle of birth and life. And, you know, as each one of our children were born, um, all parents go through this, I think, is you begin to dream. And you begin to dream about their lives and uh, what they're going to accomplish, what you're going to help them accomplish. And, and their whole life ahead of them. And you wonder what they're going to be and what they're going to do with their life. And, you know, really, I think at that time, probably the idea of living a life uh, that's worth living becomes more real than it ever has been. And, and so, you know, as, as you look at those brand new babies now, don't misunderstand me. Uh, I was a good father. I let her change all the diapers and all that good stuff. And she would hand them to me when they were asleep, and I was very good with that. And, um, but uh, something about watching them and watching them grow, uh, that all those dreams come back and there's that joy that is in your life. But, you know, one of the things today that I'm afraid that's happened within the church is that we have lost the idea of life. You know, in the years that I've been in the ministry, one of the things that is very apparent is that so many people do not live a life worth living as believers. Now, I'm not talking about the individual that does not know Jesus Christ. I'll talk to that in a minute. But right now, I'm talking about those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. You know, the Bible says Jesus came to give us life and a more abundant life. And, and it's important that you and I don't get mixed up with this. There's a lot of teachings that are going on today in the world, especially in the Christian church, that is not biblical. And one of those is that, you know, if you'll do everything God tells you to do, you'll never have a problem, uh, that you'll get wealthy and all of this stuff. And none of that is biblical, none of it. And it is important for us, though, to understand when Jesus said, I've come to give you life and a more abundant life, well, the first, of course, is eternal life. But the second part of that is that when he says, I come to give you a more abundant life, 
It is that you and I live a life that is worth living. And what I sense and what I see constantly and, and, and constantly in counsel with people is that they are struggling to get through this life. Perhaps no greater evidence of that is than uh, when you look at the 10th cause of death in the world today. You know, you got wars, you got diseases, all of those things going on, but the 10th cause of death in the world today is suicide. And here in America, even though we are the most prosperous nation that has probably ever been, uh, we, we live so well in this nation. Uh, and, that, and that goes for all of us. And, and we've forgotten to count our blessings. But when you see that second and third on a continual yearly basis, second, third, and fourth rank is suicide in the American home and in the church as well. And, and let me just say this for just for a second very quickly. If you are contemplating taking your life, do not listen to the lie of the devil, please. You, when you get to this point, that you get to that point where you think about taking your life, you, you block out everything else around you and you're just looking at your pain and you think nobody cares. Nobody cares about any of that. And, and, and you're sitting there and saying, well, they'll, they'll be better off without me. I want you to understand, your children won't be better off without you. Your spouse won't be better off without you. Your neighbors won't be better off without you. Those around you will not be better off without you. And so stop thinking like that. But if you are contemplating that, please sit down and talk to your pastor. Find someone who can give you direction in life. And, and get back to that point where you begin to realize that life is precious and there is a life that is worth living. It really is. And, and we're going to talk about that this morning. And it's important for you and I to get to that point where we understand that, especially as believers. You know, one of the, one of the great dangers that is happening in the modern church today is that the world no longer has a light to look at in order to see, in order to see the only hope there really is. For brothers and sisters, the only hope that we have is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is so important that we recognize that. And we're going to look at that today, really, about a life that is worth living. If you would, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 12 there. And it says this. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but the one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, today, as we come before you, we're so thankful already for the service that we've been able to be a part of, to worship you, to honor you. And Lord, for the festivities of this day and as we catch the excitement that is going on here at First Baptist uh, Bronson. And, and Lord, just uh, pray, first of all, your blessings on this church as you continue to work and move. Uh, thank you for the man of God that you have placed here to lead. And Lord, I pray that you will bless him and his family as well. And for all those that are servants unto you in the ministry that you place them here in this church. And so, Father, may today be another day that honors and glorifies you. May it be a day in which we truly can give you credit for things that we cannot do, but only you can do them. And so, Father, we do ask this morning that you'll speak to our hearts. You know, in this life, God, we know and we realize that there are difficult days and there are hard times. And, and yet it seems like that we have lost our way sometimes. And I just pray this morning that, that Lord, that you'll get us back on track. Get us headed in the right direction. And, God, uh, may all the glory go to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said... You know, I watched the Summer Olympics, and I don't know how many of you watched it, but there was a race in the Summer Olympics, and uh, it was called a 4 by uh, 100 and basically there's four legs of the race, four different individuals run 100 meters. 
And uh, America was, had not had the fastest time of the year, but they were expected to win that race. And uh, all the world was confident that uh, America would take home the gold. And so these young four men get out there and, and uh, they had prepared their entire life for this race. They, they were ready, they had trained, and we'll even get into that in more detail later, but just to know they didn't show up on that morning to, to go run that race, and they were ready. And, uh, and sure enough, in that first leg, they were in the lead, and they were winning, and there was probably nobody going to catch them because the faster guys were still yet to come. They went to the second leg, and everything was going great. I mean, fantastic, they were in the lead again. And then all of a sudden, in the third leg, they have what is called the passing of the baton. The passing of the baton is that one runner, and I'm sure all of you are aware of this, but one runner, as he is running at the, his leg of the race, the next person is waiting there. And just before he gets there, that runner, and they work on the timing on all of this, uh, that they, they begin to, to run, and they put their hand back, and they drop the baton in that hand. Well, as they put the baton in the hand, there was some type of mess up. They, it, it, I don't know all exactly what happened, but it didn't get dropped in at the right time. And they had been working on this. Now, they, 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 they could do this in their sleep. And something happened. And, uh, and uh, all of a sudden, they, they lost the lead. And uh, matter of fact, uh, there is a box up there, if you would, and you have to pass that baton in that box. If you don't, you are considered out of bounds. Well, this thing got all messed up. They fell way behind, but they still placed third. They still want to place third. The problem was is they were disqualified because they had run out of bounds. They had run, gone beyond that final mark, and they were out where they weren't supposed to be. You know, sometimes in life you feel like that, don't you? Have you, have you ever prepared I mean, you just, you just prepare, you, you're, you're, you're working towards it, and, and, you, and you're struggling, and, but you're, you're, you're focused on it, and then, then all of a sudden, you just feel like you're out of bounds. You feel like something is wrong, and, I, and, and then you begin to, 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 to squander the life that God has given to you. You don't know what's, what's up, what's down, what's around. You don't know. You just struggle with all of that. And, and as believers, we have seen more and more and more of that. And instead of us being a light into a darkened world, uh, we're so confused, we're so out of bounds that we don't even know how to get through it. And so as we look at these verses, there are, and I, I hope you'll get this this morning, uh, it is very clear how to live a life that is worth living. And when I say that, I'm talking about some of you are here today and you're out of bounds. I mean, you, 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 you've got a, a good face on, you, you, you got everything out front. Nobody knows you're out of bounds. You just know on the inside you're out of bounds. And, and, and you don't know where to turn, what to do. Your life is miserable. You're unhappy. There's no joy. There's no peace in your life. And so you're, you're struggling with that. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, that in life in general, that as you walk this life, there are challenges in this life. And if you're not careful, you'll hit a detour. And in the detour, it takes you off of where you should be in your life. And so how is it, how is it that you and I are to live a life that is truly a life worth living? How do we get to that point? And it doesn't matter whether you're 9 or 109. How do you live that life? The very first thing we see here, uh, if you would look back with me to Scripture, verse 12, uh, what we see here is we see there is a characteristic that is critical and is called humility. Humility. It's an honest evaluation of yourself. Not me evaluating you, you evaluating yourself. And so when you look at this, notice what he says. He says, not as though I had already attained. Now, remember, this is Paul that's writing this. Paul is a Jew among Jews. He's been educated in the greatest places. He is one of the greatest leaders uh, in, the, in the nation of Israel. He is looked up to all over. And he has all the credentials. Matter of fact, he spent the previous chapter saying that all of that was nothing but waste. It was, there was nothing there. And so he says here, he says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that which also I am apprehended for Christ. So the very first thing we see there 
is he is aware of his imperfections. In other words, he's not who maybe others think he is. Maybe even he thinks himself. But here's what's happened in American church. In the American church, we have forgotten that we are sinners saved by grace. We have forgotten that our righteousness is as filthy rags before our holy God. We have forgotten what God has done for us. You know, most of us come to God with the attitude that says this, God, I'm not as bad as the fellow sitting next to me. I want you just real quick for me, look at the guy next, sitting next to you. Just let him know that you agree with what the preacher's saying, all right? And so you, you sit there and you go, well, I'm not really that bad. Listen, friend, being honest and humble, you and I realize that we are imperfect. Do you know what, you know what the, the opposite of humility is? It's called pride. In Proverbs chapter 6, God lists seven different things that he hates. The very first one is pride. He says he hates pride. That is where we think we are special. And I want you to understand, you and I get to heaven not because we are special, but because God is special. Because while we were yet sinners, he sent his son Jesus to die for us and pay for our sins, even when we didn't want it. When he didn't want it. When we want nothing to do with him. He still never stopped loving us. Why is it that after we get saved, that all of a sudden we think we got something that God loves? It's, it's better than what everybody else has. The only thing that I have, that you have, that this world doesn't have, that is better than this world, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is because of Christ that you and I can call God our Heavenly Father. And so we see this. Notice, notice how he puts this. He says, "For uh, though I have already not attained, there were already, either were perfect, but I follow after it. And he says, I'm not perfect but then he says but I follow after it what does he follow after he says I, I've not attained it yet and yet I'm following after it and, and that's the question and this is a question that you have to ask yourself that will change your entire life if, when you first recognize in your life that in humility that you are imperfect that you are a sinner and you understand that and there's nothing good within us that when we understand that, then we begin to understand that there is something that we need to attain, we need to drive towards. What is that? Well, he says here, he says, I drive towards it. If you go over to the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 29, it gives us clear insight to that. Then very simply says, he did predestine us to be conformed on the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So here you go. I believe that one of the reasons that Christians struggle in this life I believe that one of the great problems is because of this. We don't understand our purpose. It's not about coming to church. It's not. I mean, it's not about, it's not about doing all those religious things. It's not. Now, that's part of being a Christian, but that's not what it's all about. Do you know what your purpose is in life? He tells us there in Romans 8, he says that for you to be predestined. Why? Why? What, what are you supposed to be predestined to? You are to be predestined to the image of Christ. In other words, friend, you should be living your life to honor and glorify Christ that people might see Christ in your life. You wonder why so many Christians are walking around in darkness? is because they think it's their career. They think it's well, their performance. They think of all these other things, and it is none of those things. You and I need to understand that the single most important event in the history of the world is when the Son of God came to this world and died on a cross and rose from the grave, proving he was the Son of God, and that he gives us through that death, burial, and resurrection the promise of forgiveness and eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. And so you and I have got to ask ourselves, in our life, are we striving to be Christ-like? Ask your family, 
if you act like Jesus every day of the week? Or is it just Sunday when you get to church? Because I know some of you had an argument on the way to church today. <laughs> and so ask. Let's get honest. Because listen, the purpose of our life is to be Christ-like. The, the, the drive that should be in our life is that we, we should have an honest evaluation of who we are. And once that takes place, once we understand that, and then we understand what is it that God left us here for. Hey, I'd hate to tell you this, but I used to be young when I was pastoring here. <laughs> Not no more. Not no more. Matter of fact, I look at some of y'all that were here when I was here, and you're older than me. And you know what? It ain't going to stop for you or me or nobody. And what are you here for? We're here for one thing and one thing only. To be the image of Christ to a lost and darkened world. Okay, once, once we get that settled, once we begin to understand, I believe you can't do anything good until you know the purpose. You can't do anything right until you know the purpose. If I know the purpose of life, of what I'm supposed to be living, how I'm supposed to be living, then I know what I'm supposed to be doing. And so that gives me that direction. I want you to look at verse 13. Because in verse 13, we go from the humility, the honest evaluation, and what we see here is there is a hungering or a holy motivation, if you would. Watch what he says. Brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. So there is a, there is a determined concentration, if you would. And what was that? Notice what he says. I count myself not to apprehend it, but this I know. For the prize that has been set before me, I reach forward. And so there is a determination. There is a conviction there. Any of you have ever competed in sports, one of the things in sports, you know that you don't just get off your couch and show up on the field, uh, whatever, whatever venue it may be, and all of a sudden you're, you're the best person in the sport. It just doesn't happen that way. Most all of us realize that if you're going to prepare for a sport, and I, actually the Olympics are usually like the, the icing on the cake, it's what everybody shoots for, and everybody wants to be there. And so anybody that, that has prepared for that knows there's a lot of work, there's a lot of discipline, but there is a lot of concentration into that as well. I'll never forget when I was uh, wrestling and um, my dad came and he saw me and uh, he got me after the wrestling mat, match and he says, why'd you do that? I said, why'd I do what, dad? He says, uh, he says you got out there before everybody was wrestling and everything uh, and while matches were going on and you'd walk to a certain point and you'd stop and you'd turn around and you'd walk back to this point over here and you'd stop and then you'd turn around and you'd walk back. Do you have a mark on the floor? Because you went to the same spot. I said, yeah, there's a mark on the floor. My name's Mark. I was on the floor. Amen. And uh, I said, no, I don't have a mark out there. He says, well, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to get ready for the match trying to get myself prepared, concentrating, trying to remember what I had been trained. If I was lucky and I was fortunate that someone had made a tape of my opponent, that I had studied his weaknesses, and so concentrating, oh, these are where he's weak, this is where his strengths are at. And so and my, my intent was very simply is just to concentrate, concentrate on that match that was before me so that I might come out the champion that I might come out the winner on the other side. And so it, I would do that, and I didn't know I went to a certain spot and turned around and went back, and a certain spot and turned around and came back. Had no idea. All I knew is I was out there getting ready for that match. And so I was preparing myself. Watch what he says here, because in this he says, Brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. What does it say? It says that he forgets, those things that are behind him. What does that mean? Well, there's two points to that. First of all, first of all, look, the Bible says about your past life, when you gave your life to Jesus, 
old things are passed away, all things are new. You are a new creation in Jesus Christ. And if you are looking back to the past, you are chaining yourself to the events of the past and you can't move forward. And how many of us, how many of us are changing? You say, you don't understand the stupid things I did. Listen to me, listen to me, understand. God understood. That's why he sent his son to die for us. And you know what he says? When you receive Christ, he forgot your past. Amen. I mean, it, there's a lot of people walking around with guilt, chained to that guilt, with whatever, that way back then. And yes, sin carries guilt. But when we go to the Lord, he said he's faithful and just to forgive us of sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. In other words, God forgives us and says, get up and go now. But what happens is we keep looking to the past and we're tethered to that past. There are people that have done things to you in the past and, and they, they hurt you and they did something wrong and you're sitting there and you can't get over it. And the Bible says you need to forgive as God has forgiven you and move forward in your life. And so this is what he says. He says, there, he says I do this one thing. I forget those things which are behind. Let me just talk about one more thing. Too often we like to live in the past because it's comfortable. Have you ever noticed things change in time? Have you ever noticed that? And sometimes, sometimes we don't like those changes. And, and we have a tendency to go back and say, well, when I was young, this is what we did. Or, my daddy would have whooped my tail back then. And it's like, okay, you know what I learned in life? Now, I'm a senior adult, and I got 12 grandchildren. I had to admit after my fifth one, I had grandchildren. And y'all laugh a little bit. You're kind of miserable this morning. <laughs> and, uh, and, and uh, you know, and I'm sitting here, and I... I in my life, if you want to go back and you want to bring up what I've learned is people really don't care. Amen. They really don't care. You start telling them about your life, what do they do? They turn you off. Now, I will say this to you. I will say this to you. Listen to me. Listen to me. One of the great privileges that I've had as pastor when I was here, there are are many people that you don't even realize you're sitting next to a hero. We don't take time to sit and listen to people talk. And I can remember, I can remember the stories of some of the older men that would tell me about fighting in World War II, just amazed, that were, were deacons here, that were men in the church, uh, battles that they fought, and that was history to me. And I'm sitting there and just overwhelmed. And, but the one great thing about being a pastor is that I get to know people and in getting to know people, I learn their life stories and it's just absolutely amazing. You don't ever really know who's sitting next to you. I mean, you'd be surprised. There's probably a, a tremendous athlete that won something 50 years ago, 60 years ago, don't even know it. And because one of the things as you get older, you realize when you start telling those stories, people look at you and go, nah, that ain't no way. Nah, nah, you don't, you don't look like a wrestler. No, nah, no. Nah. You, know, you know, you look more like a basket weaver. Yeah, you don't look like a wrestler. And, and so, they, so then you understand that and we close up and we don't share as much, but I believe historically, uh, and uh, it's important to pass on from generation to generation uh, your life, but, but we don't tie our lives back there. If we're living on past uh, winds, if you would, then well, all it does is give us excuses not to win today. It just, it's just an excuse to say, I don't have to face this today. I don't have to deal with this today. I, I, I'll go back to this. It's safer. It's always calmer back then instead of, no, what it is, is that you and I need to realize that so often we go back to the past where we can make excuses for the present. Here, let me give you this illustration. God promises you peace and joy. That's what he promises you. In this life, 
He promised you peace and joy. If you're not experiencing that, then you have to ask yourself, when you do a, a good look at yourself, why? Why? You don't understand what I'm going through, Pastor. You don't understand the difficulties that I'm facing. No, I didn't ask you that. I may not understand those things, but I do know this. The creator of this universe who gave us life, the creator who gave, breathed life into you and gives you this life that you're here right now, if he promises you peace and joy, why aren't you experiencing it? And the reason that we don't experience it is because we've been putting our faith in things that when it gets to the end of their life, they mean absolutely nothing. It doesn't help us in our life. It doesn't help us to face tomorrow. I remember when I was a, when I was a deputy sheriff, and I can remember the older gentlemen that would retire from the sheriff's department. Many of them were lieutenants and captains and stuff, and they would come back into the department. And they were retired. And those of you that are retired may understand this story, but I can remember seeing their faces just the day before. There were people in authority. There were people that, that had respect of their peers. And, and as they came back, it was like people didn't have time for them. And they had spent their whole life pouring it into their job. And at the end of their life, when they finally had to step out of that job, all of a sudden they began to wonder and saying, is this all there is to life? And I'm telling you, it is not all there is to life. And wherever you are, whatever job you are, whatever you're doing, you should be doing the very best you can. As, and the Bible says, do it as unto the Lord. You should be working and you should be the best worker and the hardest worker of all because you do it unto God. But bottom line, your job, your, your vocation, whatever it is, your education, whatever it is, it will not meet your needs when you get to the end of this life. Only Jesus does that. Only Jesus. You see, when you love God and you live with God and you grow with God and, and as, you, as you study God and you learn more about God, when it comes to the end of your life, you all of a sudden understand that you've lived a life that was great and you understand how wonderful life is, but you wonder, you, want, you realize that what makes it wonderful is not all the things you did, but it is what God did for you. And that's why he says here, I forget those things which are behind. And then he says, and I reach forth unto those things which are before. How many of you have uh, put up dead end in your life? You've just, you, you've gotten to the point now. We well, are at the point where pff, life. And I deal with folks like this all the time. Just dead end. <laughs> Can I tell you there's no dead end? Do you, know, do you know that when you leave this, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? I don't know. I, many of you know James Keene passed away this year, who's such a sweet, sweet man. He was my maintenance guy when we were here. And, and he was he just a wonderful guy. And I and got a phone call from a nephew and said that he was not doing well. And so I got to call and talk to him for a few minutes. And, and, uh, and, and uh, he laughed at a couple of things because I told him, I said, do you remember the Holy House? And, you know, you, you, and, and, and I said, do you remember? It was only you and I that worked on it that first year. I mean, and he had to do it because I was paying him. Amen. <laughs> and, 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 what, and he was there all the time, working, working, working. Just, just a lovely, lovely man. And I, I, I stop, and when I look at these, and look, folks, it's not about last year it's not even about today it's about where you headed the bible says in the end days people will be in the days of noah they will be eating and drinking being married with no thought of tomorrow and i'm going to tell you when he says here he says that that about the future let me tell you what the future is it's called christ one day you and i are going to make it to heaven. I mean, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, there's not going to be any taxes. Amen? There's not going to be any arthritis. There's not going to be any scars. 
There, there's not going to be any heartache. That it is a place that you and I are destined for. But how are we going to get there if we're not looking for the end? Where is the motivation in your life today? Are you more concerned about building your treasures up here on this earth than building the treasures up in heaven? Listen to me. You can't take your treasures with you. They're not going with you. They're going to be left behind for somebody else to fight over. They're not going with you. You don't own anything. God owns it all. He created it all. Go back to Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. He created everything. It is His. But there's coming a day at the end of this life that you and I are going home. What a glorious day. Now, for those of you that are younger, I'll never forget my son. He's not here today, but I'll never forget he came to me and he was falling in love with a young lady. And uh, I would talk to him. We would talk in our family times and stuff and we'd talk about the return of Christ and all of this and how excited we are about the return of Christ and, and we'd talk about different things. No, one, no man knows the hour nor the day or any of that. And he pulled me off to the side one day and he says, Dad, I need to talk to you. And remember, he'd just fallen in love. He says, uh, he says, isn't it wrong for me to pray for Christ not to come back right now? I said, what? <laughs> what? He says, well, he says, can, can I ask him to come after my honeymoon night? <laughs> and my response, never mind, I won't tell you my response. We're in church. <laughs> uh, the future. I will tell you this, I teach a men's group, it's a three year long program. And one of the things that we talk about is finishing your race. But we talk about looking to the end of your race. And I, I just pose this to you men. Ladies, you're welcome to take it as well, but I just wanna pose this to you guys. How do you wanna leave this earth? You wanna be known as a reprobate? Let me, let me, just, let me just warn everybody here. I don't ever preach anybody to heaven. The only way you get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. That's it. And let me tell you something. Preachers who preach people into heaven that live like the devil, everybody in the community knows they're a liar. Okay, so you, you, I can't get you into heaven. But I will tell you this. You and I ought to live our life every day as men of God that we know at the end of this life that we want to leave this land as men of integrity, men that were known to be godly men that love the Lord Jesus and love their family, love their community, and set that example. How do you want to leave? Because if you will set your eyes on that, then you walk the right line. You know, the Bible says any man that looks back is not worthy for the kingdom of heaven. It is an agricultural uh, description of where uh, when you look back, when you're plowing, those of the older may understand this, that when you're plowing, when you look back, you lose focus to the front, and then it's a mess. Those guys that were, that were running the 4 by 100 they, they, one of them got so frustrated because he was waiting for that baton to drop, and it didn't drop, and it didn't drop, and he turned around, and as soon as he turned around, he lost all focus of where he was going. Lost all focus. Know where you're headed. Now understand that you're looking to that time. When I leave this earth, I want to leave this earth as a man of God. I want to leave this earth as a man of a credibility and a man of character. And that is for the ladies as well. And so how do you want to leave? Because I will tell you it will determine what you're going to act like today. And then lastly, and I'm going to close this, which for the Baptist pastor means absolutely nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to notice the high calling. It says, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Well, the, the word there, press towards that mark, is actually a, a word that describes the stretching of your tendons, the uh, stretching of the fibers of your tendons. And so what he's saying is that in this race, as he's running this race, he stretches himself so that he can attain the prize, that he can reach out and get that prize. He, he realizes that as he walks his life, he says, I press towards that mark. And if you stretch, and as you get older, you realize you have to stretch because if you don't, you pull a hamstring. You do all sorts of, anybody pull a hamstring? Besides me, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I got, matter of fact, the first time I did it was here in Bronson. My kids were riding their bikes and they said, come on, daddy, we'll race you. And I said, I got this. 
they're just little little whippersnappers. I jumped on my I jumped on my feet and took off running, and they were catching up to me. And then all of a sudden, snap! And man, I still got that scar back there where I ripped that because my five year old beat me running because <laughs> I didn't stretch. But you know, when you stretch those things out, much less opportunity of destroying yourself. And so we know that stretching, there's a, that, that it takes time and energy and effort to do that. And as you stretch, and that's what he's saying, he says, I'm stretching to the prize that is before us. And that prize is what God has for us in his kingdom. I want to leave you with this and hope that you understand this. Sometimes people forget why they're here. My mother um, passed away at 95. And uh, I remember talking to her, and I remember it was so funny, and those of you that are older recognize what I'm saying. I now understand exactly what she's saying. She says, Mark, you don't understand. I go into a room for something, and I don't remember what I'm going in there for. <laughs> now, if you're older, I admit it. I have gone in room. My wife, she, I can't do this in front of her because she won't let me live it down. I'll sit there on my phone talking to her, and I said, Deborah, I got to go. I got to find my phone. <laughs> and she'd go, what? You know, I got to find my phone. And I'm thinking, oh, no, not again, not again. And so you feel like a complete idiot. Sometimes as Christians, we forget why we're here, and we forget why we went there. Folks, listen to me. If you want a life that's worth living, remember, it is to honor Jesus Christ with your life. And it is not an easy task. You will be pulled from every direction possible. The devil will try to destroy you. The devil will try to defeat you. But you let him know who your Savior is, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, when you finish this race that you have strived for, that you are directed, and you understand it is not by your ability, but it is because of God's humility that he came to this earth to give you a second chance in this life. You got one life to live. Don't ruin it. You're not going to get a second chance at this. If today you are not living the life that is worth living, then stop believing the lies of the devil and start trusting God. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it means do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? The Bible is very plain. Every one of us are sinners. And because of that sin, you and I cannot enter heaven. And there is only one way that we can be forgiven, and that is through what God did for us in sending his son to the cross. And raising him from the grave. And all you have to do, it is a free gift of God, is to open your heart and say, Lord, I need you in my life. I am sorry for what I have done. And I ask you to be Lord of my life. Inviting Jesus Christ. That's where it starts at. And then those of us who have done that, those of us who have knelt down and received Christ into our life as our Lord and Savior, let's make sure we don't get sidetracked. There are people outside of these walls. There are people in your homes. There are people all around you that need to see the gospel of Jesus Christ in action, and they only see that through God's people. And your purpose, you have been predestined into the image of Christ. You say, I'm not going to do that. I don't care whether Jesus did it or not. Then you might want to check your salvation. Because, listen, it is not this life that I live, but in this life I live for Christ. For me to live is Christ. To die is gain. It changes everything in your life. All of a sudden, you're no longer just in a world just going along. Nobody knows who you are. We got like 4 billion people in this world. How many of them know you? Not many, but I will tell you who does. The one who knows every one of them by name and has the very hairs on their head counted. And he knows you personally and he sent his son Jesus to die for you. And you know what? 
Dying for Christ isn't that hard. It's living for him that's so often difficult. A life worth living. Think about this for just a second. Wouldn't it be good to get a new wife or a new husband? Oh, well, my, my wife, she all, no, I'm not talking about my wife. I'm not, I wouldn't be. I'm talking about your wife, no. You know, and you know how you get a new wife? You know how you get a new husband? When the wife or the husband starts living for Jesus, that's when it changes. Can I tell you all something? Look, those of you that are married, my wife's right here. She can't walk today because she threw her back out, but she's here with me. I tried to tell her to stay, and she wouldn't stay. But her, 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 I want you to look at the person that, that you're married to and say, hey, I just want you to know. I'm as sorry as what you think I am. Oh, my lands. I'm serious. Hey, honey, I just want you to know I'm sorry. And I'm a sorry person, but you're lucky you got me. Amen. (laughs) But we need to evaluate ourselves because you're not a prize catch. You're just like the rest of us. We all think we're some beautiful fish, but we just mullet. <laughs> I know about mullet from when I was here. And let me just say this to you. What makes you a prize catch is the one who created you, and that is Jesus Christ. Live a life worth living. You say, what about all these years behind me? You can't get the water that's under the bridge, but you can change the water going under the bridge today. Change it. Don't listen to the lies of people. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. God wants to use you to touch the lives of people for the only thing that will matter in eternity, and that is eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. I'm talking to the church. If you're playing with God, you got to stop. You got to stop. Thank you so much for allowing me to come and share with you this morning God's word, which I believe what the word of God says is that that it will not return void. And it is by the word of God that we grow. And so I thank you for allowing me to do this. And I thank you for allowing me to come back. But I'm going to tell you what I'm really grateful for. All the friendships that I have here and all the people I know. And there's fewer than there was even a couple years ago because they're already home with the Lord. More than any of that is there is a God who is a creator of this universe that loved me so much and you that he would send his only begotten son to give us a second chance. That's the priority of life. God bless you, and may you all have a wonderful day. You know this altar is